It's on triple iso oxygen isotopes in evolving continental crust, granites, and clastic sediments. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. So uh, uh, from theory, we go back to Earth, and this is the local scene in Eugene, Oregon, in the winter time. It's pretty rainy, and uh, when you when I walk in, on, on Sundays, I just uh, sometimes think of weathering when the reservoir is drained, and uh, so much soil is exposed uh, and sediments is exposed to air and water. I'm thinking of weathering and thinking what happened um, uh, in the past. So I'd like to thank my collaborators and funding agencies. So my talk uh, will include uh, four parts and I will concentrate on three. First, I'll talk about triple oxygen isotopes and weathering and uh, providing some principles. And then we talk about clays in modern river basins. Uh, well, then I talk about how we can uh, uh, convert this clays into a sedimentary rock uh, through smictite to elite transition. And uh, we'll use an example of deep Texas drill core where we did some analysis. Then I'll took the sedimentary rocks and uh, talk about shales through time. Uh, uh, shales are known since 3.4. Then we'll uh, switch gears and uh, talk a little bit about granites through time, which will have a similar record to shales. I will uh, draw attention to significant jumps, which we discovered um, through time. It's uh, occurring at approximately 2.4, 2.3 uh, billion years ago at a broadly Archean Proterozoic transition, which we connected to emergence of land. And uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, Archean and Precambrian seawater and Delta Etino Valley, very contentious issue. And uh, we'll talk about Archean paleo temperature and I will be using shales as an archive to talk about these uh, processes. Okay, so advantages of triple oxygen isotopes, mass dependent fractionation of triple oxygen isotopes, small numbers changes are uh, started from Puck and Herbert's paper 2014. Uh, basically, we have two, uh, uh, three equations. Uh, we have two equations to resolve uh, uh, within the same isotopic system. We need to make, of course, assumptions about equilibrium and its preservation and geological record and studied samples and make some assumptions about involved meteoric waters. For, for example, I'll be making an assumptions that meteoric water vary along the line 0 0.5 to 8 which is a, a uniformitarian number. I don't think it changed in the Archean. Okay, uh, so this slide shows um, an, uh, an equation, equilibration equations, which were first put together by Zach Sharp in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> so typically what we do in samples, we measure uh, value of uh, silicates, like in this case quartz for 18O and 17O, and we are trying to resolve uh, temperature formation in water. So we have unknowns, uh, uh, isotopic value of water and temperature in this equation. So you can see that these equations are uh, quite ugly um, and uh, they, they can only be solved by mathematical um, manipulation. Uh, it's like three equations, three unknowns. Uh, and then uh, we generate three roots and sometimes equations cannot solve. Okay, so you need to do some a little bit of manipulation to numerically solve these equations for these parameters. And you need to make a new, uh, badly need the third equation for which in this work, work we'll use a, a isotopic value of uh, meteoric water and I will vary this parameter excess, but I will say that this parameter is uniformitarian. Uh, to graphically illustrate this, I plotted um, uh, quartz water equilibration curves. For example, for sample one in this diagram, which we use relative to 5.3 or uh, 5, uh, these samples will plot on the line if you can solve it. Numerically, it will give you a temperature of uh, nine degrees Celsius and minus 15 per mil meteoric water from which it's coming from. So you basically, here is your parental water and here is your sample. So for this sample, uh, it, uh, you can solve it for uh, 25 degrees Celsius perhaps and minus five per mil water. Okay, if sample crystallized from uh, ocean water, then uh, uh, it will follow this line of equilibration. And uh, it happened to be that the standard developed by Martin Miller uh, uh, this, which is Cretaceous Flint, um, it plots uh, pretty perfectly on a, a minus 0.7 preglacial uh, seawater um, and a temperature of approximately 35 degrees Celsius. So effects are shown here and how we can resolve it is temperature, of course, works this way, uh, uh, greater fractionation at uh, a lower temperature and uh, meteoric water effects, uh, varying meteoric water uh, working this way. I will not have time to talk about evaporation effects, uh, but this is also present a little bit. Uh, what about other minerals? 
So uh, this field is developing and uh, Zach Sharp and uh, Jordan uh, Wasbrough just presented uh, a nice chapter. For, my, uh, for, for example, for calcite, they pr predicted that calcite plots a little bit above quartz. Okay, for quartz, we have the golden standard here. For calcite, it's a little bit above. What about clays? I'll be talking about shales, therefore we need to talk about clays. So uh, I took uh, this figure from uh, uh, Edwin's um, chapter, and um, yeah, you see that some clays are plotted uh, above and some clays are plotted below uh, the quartz water fractionation curves, but basically they are very close to the quartz water fractionation curve. So we need to derive the bulk shale fractionation factor uh, and bulk clay fractionation factor um, uh, for our uh, work and uh, for numerical solution for waters, etc. Weathering um, uh, clays are normally a mixture of uh, these components, which you can see. Uh, there is a nice fractionation data set for uh, 18O uh, clays of various clays. You can take the weighted average and we get uh, this line. Uh, it's going to be shorter by about 8 per mil compared to quartz because clays do not fractionate oxygen as efficiently as quartz. Um, and then uh, I can take, um, uh, I use the natural uh, watersheds um, in the world to calibrate this number. It uh, actually plots very close to the quartz water fractionation curve. So the bulk clay water would plot will have the same shape as for quartz. It will be shifted a little bit up. I think it will be the best solution. Um, so the natural experiment which I am um, talking about is uh, when you consider clays from major uh, rivers and minor rivers around the world, which span climates from uh, tropical to um, uh, polar. And we analyzed 44 studied watersheds uh, and analyzed clays for triple oxygen isotopes uh, in this, um, and also seals and sands from these rivers. Uh, besides different climates, uh, the different rivers, especially small rivers, they sample different um, uh, context, geological context. Large river normally sample mixed bedrocks, uh, average con continental crust, while uh, some rivers, especially in New Zealand, would sample volcanic bedrock, others in Finland will sample igneous, metamorphic, etc. So it turns out it doesn't really matter what uh, bedrock they sample because the clays really record delta 18 or delta 17 or value of water uh, uh, via the fractionation equations. For example, for Mississippi River, we'll get uh, this mean annual temperature, which I'll be talking about, and the mean annual precipitation for this watershed. Uh, when we plot the bulk shale analysis versus mean annual temperature, we actually uh, may be disappointing they observe no trend. So uh, the, uh, either clays are plotted here or some scatter average clay around the world is plus 16 per mil, uh, or you can compute weathering products by using the chemical or XRD determined uh, proportions of uh, detrital materials and uh, they will plot also with, without much trend. 17 no parameter also does not change very much um, in the, across different climate zones. So why is that? Well, uh, as I said, clays, they promote, uh, primarily record as a topic value of meteoric water and temperature of interaction, uh, and, but bedrock doesn't matter. So uh, that's an equation how you can get a value of clays. You take meteoric water, uh, uh, which is dependent on temperature, depending where you are in the world. In pro tropical climate, you get um, uh, uh, meteoric water, which is very close to small. And uh, when you go to polar environments, the isotopic value of water is light. Uh, but isotopic fractionation at um, uh, low temperature is also greater. So these two effects compensate each other. And this is why you get uh, uh, this flat line. So also uh, point out, I compiled data for uh, modern rivers, uh, delta 18 value for modern rivers. I wish there were more data for 17 O in modern rivers. And then I fitted the line and uh, my line for modern rivers is approximately the same, not approximately, almost exactly the same as the linear fit through this data set from Bowen at all global meteoric water uh, precipitation. Okay, so it's not surprising that rivers broadly reflect meteoric water. Um, so these two trends, is it the bad news uh, or is it the good news? Well, it's maybe a bad news for uh, paleoclimatology or climatology, but we are talking about bulk clays. So Preet Chamberlain, for example, will not be using bulk clays to investigate uh, climates uh, in various parts of the world. So uh, kaolinite or smectites should be used for this purpose. But maybe this is a good news uh, because it's a direct test. It's a first, first of all, simple relation and a direct test for global climate. Uh, and then also it's a direct uh, test 
for global seawater delta T no value. Because for example, if seawater were minus 10 per mil lighter, this whole thing would shift 10 per mil. So the summary uh, for weathering, which I, I just described, basically no difference with bedrock type clay mostly reflects meteoric water. Uh, one can um, compute global weathering fluxes based on um, offset between uh, clay and the bedrock. So we revised uh, the modern weathering fluxes by about 50% in this paper and uh, no change with mean annual temperature. Okay, now I, uh, second part of my talk is uh, we'll move to, toward the geologic past. And uh, I'll uh, talk about bulk shale as a proxy of, for weathering conditions. So shale, as you know, is um, uh, three quarters of all sedimentary rocks. So this is the rock, uh, the most important sedimentary rocks uh, on earth. Um, it's known since early times and forms approximately the same uh, way. It's used in many studies using multiple isotopes and chemical elements for uh, continental com uh, co composition of the continental crust through time, etc. Uh, oxygen is perhaps the only element, maybe besides hydrogen, which uh, we use shales uh, as a monitors of hydrosphere, not lithosphere. So the shales is cons uh, consist one third quartz, uh, two third clay. So we can modify our equations in a way which I uh, showed you before to compute uh, environmental parameters based on bulk shale analysis. Uh, also, uh, shale here is a, uh, has low permeability because it's very fine grain, uh, unlike sandstones, for example, which develop overgrowth. So this is the perfect shale. This is the shale which underwent secondary crystallization. You can avoid sampling uh, coarse, coarse and material, uh, material and uh, just target uh, primary material. Okay. Uh, but now question of uh, what to study. Do, should we study clays in the shale or just a bulk shale? And uh, I'm arguing that you can just take the fresh bulk shale because it gives you almost as good proxy for uh, uh, in environmental conditions as the clay. So uh, Texas group, uh, they investigated uh, clays uh, versus bulk, and I plotted the data set. This is our data set uh, for Texas drill core. You can see that uh, bulk shale is uh, maybe 0 0.9 to 0.3 per mil heavier than um, the clay analysis. And uh, on the slide on the right, uh, I reanalyzed uh, samples from deep Texas drill core, which goes to 5 kilometers, 5.5 kilometers uh, uh, undergoing diagenesis. So these are my bulk shale analysis, which uh, overlap with the previously determined delta is no value for fine clay extracted various ways with some little offset kind of similar to what is shown here. And here's the data for the diagenesis. So in this deep Texas drill core, uh, which samples broad the Mississippi River uh, watershed area, you get the transition from smictite to illite. So you go from very loose sediments such as Mississippi Delta clays plotted here and the mostly smictitic material. And then when temperature goes to 200 degrees Celsius at five kilometers in depth, uh, you, you form uh, like very laminated shale uh, uh, consisting of illite. So this is XRD determined proportion of uh, illite in each sample. So you can see that it's almost 100% illite here. And this is accompanied by expulsion of water and the water, pore water, which is present in the sample is shifted to a um, positive value and delta is no value of bulk shale and bulk clays are shifted towards slightly light, uh, lighter value. So this is called diagenetic shift here. So it's described in the chapter. I will uh, have little time talking about it. But basically there is no uh, difference, ma major difference in um, considering how much temperature has changed here. Okay, And especially for triple oxygen isotopic value, uh, in this diagenetic win, uh, transition, we observe no particular change. So we can uh, trust um, as a triple oxygen isotopic value uh, of um, uh, diagenetically formed uh, shales almost as much as we can uh, uh, trust the loose unconsolidated sediment. Um, moving away from diagenesis and then let's say metamorphism and melting. So this figure is taken from Buchholz and Spencer. Uh, they uh, wrote a paper about strongly pyroluminous granites. So the granites which have um, evidence of uh, derivation from 100% remelt of the sedimentary crust. And they commonly contain 
garnets, corundum, and other uh, aluminous phases. So uh, I just said that um, diagenesis does not change uh, triple oxygen isotopic signature uh, of shales. We go to uh, meta metasedimentary rocks. Uh, claim is if it's an isochemical process, you will inherit triple oxygen isotopic value of your protolith. And then when you even go to uh, uh, peraluminous granite, uh, this peraluminous granite will contain oxygen, which is derived from hydrosphere, maybe eons ago, but uh, it's clearly uh, in, uh, reflecting uh, oxygen as a major element. So therefore, it's very hard to mess around with oxygen unless you have massive percolation of fluids, secondary fluids, etc. So therefore, we can use uh, um, high, high grade rock if you need to, and maybe even speculate about the meaning of triple oxygen isotopic value of zircons in uh, granites or metamorphic rocks. So shales through time and global climate and delta the value of the hydrosphere. So we will use weathering products and higher grade rocks. Uh, we uh, claim that uh, shale is formed the same way throughout the geologic history. Bulk shale preserves weathering signature. We use it as an archive for climate. Uh, and then we compare apples with apples. Uh, we compare shales and with shales. So if you don't like my math, how I converted this to temperature, you can make some uh, corrections to these uh, maps, but still uh, uh, in a relative sense, uh, we are comparing shales of shales. This is unlike, uh, for example, chirts, which um, uh, David Zakharov was talking about, polygenetic nature of chirts. And we are talking about products of weathering of the surface. Here on this slide, I compare three archives, um, carbonates, shorts, and shales. Um, the carbonates and shorts have been known for maybe 50 years now to uh, experiencing an increase in delta eighteen value with youth, uh, in particular in the Phanerozoic time. Um, in the large compilation of this uh, data set, which was available before us, and the new uh, data set, which we provided in this cha chapter in the prior paper, uh, we also observe an increase in delta is no value of shales um, through time, but the pattern of increase is different. For example, in the Phanerozoic time, we get the big smile here, which is also mirrored by strontium as the big value of shales, uh, suggesting that it's a, a, a supercontinent cycle here. In some other cases, uh, uh, shales record um, glacial episodes and ultralight uh, delta is no water, as similar to what happened during the Neoproterozoic and Paleoproterozoic glaciations as recorded by till lights. Okay, so we'll try to resolve whether this one is a result of um, uh, using the shale as a new archive, which uh, we'll use now uh, to complement uh, the pre existing uh, data sets. We'll try to use shales to uh, talk about the paleo uh, conditions in, in Archean and uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Proterozoic uh, times. It's uh, a little bit um, more complicated because uh, shales are derived from meteoric water. Yeah, well, uh, ideally, carbonates and chorts would uh, result, uh, would crystallize from uh, seawater, so you can get a direct insight. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, for chorts, uh, it's uh, not so simple, and the carbonates undergo secondary alteration. Uh, in order to do that, we'll consider the triple oxygen isotopic diagram like that. If uh, the seawater were lighter in the Archean, uh, we will shift it uh, by uh, using the slope, um, steep slope from Sindhupt in, in Pak, or the slope which we think is um, uh, based on this chapter is a little bit different, but it go basically goes from the mantle to the, through the ocean water and up. But the basic conclusion here is that um, if you were to shift seawater, it should gain delta 17 ohm. And therefore, meteoric water associated with this shifted seawater would be high, even higher than 17 ohm, because it's a meteoric water which is parental to shales. So if we have a sample floating here and we're able to resolve it numerically, it will either give you 75 degrees uh, formation temperature if you use the modern uh, meteoric water line, or if you use the very extreme minus 25 per mil, um, uh, sorry, minus 15 per mil. Um, seawater that would correspond to minus 25 per mil meteoric water, the sample will give you one degree Celsius. Okay, so we will try to understand um, well, uh, uh, this parameter Y uh, is an excess of 17O parameter. Um, um, 
related to shift of uh, the seawater. So the first comparison of apples of apples is uh, Archean shales versus post-Archean shales and synglacial shales. Uh, the Archean shales uh, are plotting in a very narrow range of parameters. Notice here meteoric water uh, influence and temperature influence. Uh, when we compare it to post-Archean shales, the post-Archean shales are occupy a wide range of um, uh, meteoric waters and um, uh, temperature formation. So synglacial shales, they show like a trend toward low delta HNO uh, values. When we plot uh, even more complicated uh, diagram here, we plot modern river sediments. And uh, again, these Archean shales and the uh, blue field is um, post-Archean shales and the individual data points are uh, clays from different uh, water uh, watersheds regions. Uh, we observe the same relationships. So basically modern river sediments uh, <clears throat> overlap nicely with uh, post-Archean shales. Uh, this work also present analysis for sand and silt. Uh, the Archean, uh, sorry, Antarctic, Antarctic clay formed in the middle of Antarctica has a low delta HNO value. It's a modern clay, which would nicely put it to a minus uh, maybe 35 per mil delta HNO value. Um, okay, so that was a comparison. When we plot big cup 17 parameter versus age, um, that's maybe the easiest way to uh, comprehend this change uh, starting at the approximately Archean Proterozoic uh, boundary. So we observe a, a rather significant step function um, in the big up 17 or uh, either relative to this exponent or 0.5 to 8 exponent. Uh, so Uh, parameter which is comparable to modern river clays, while Archean uh, shales they uh, in, uh, have um, narrow ranges and overlap mostly with the uh, mental uh, values. Uh, individual um, we used composite samples for geological formation, and uh, a large symbol here represents a composite of twenty samples. And uh, there is some inter interquartile statistics. Uh, although there is a scatter, as you would expect, for sedimentary rocks, uh, this step function is very nicely re resolved uh, by any statistical analysis um, using either of the exponents. We attributed this to um, basically emergence of land. Uh, so the modern work looks uh, very similar to what perhaps happened in uh, um, early Proterozoic when we created the first supercontinent. This first supercontinent had mountain ranges uh, and uh, it would span uh, significant la uh, latitudes from tropical to polars, generating meteoric waters of different um, delta HNO and delta 17 values. Uh, while the Archean world would likely uh, was mostly submerged world with uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, crust sticking out of seawater and the shales would be forming only in the subarily exposed severely exposed uh, areas of the continental crust. Um, okay, so here's my cartoon for the Archean world. Uh, it tells you that climate should be warm, similar to modern day tropics. Um, uh, you get some silicification effects, you get some evaporation eff effects uh, relating to enrichment of some 17 or shales deposition and uh, the movement uh, uh, away from um, the mantle and through the seawater will generate uh, light uh, delta HNO meteoric water and we'll try to resolve it. Uh, can we move uh, to one per mil, five per mil, 10 per mil, etc. And um, so the solution <coughs> for the Archean world using the modern meteoric water line, which is given here, uh, we observe um, that um, temperature would be higher in the Archean. Uh, but not as high as predicted by Church, for example. But still, it's like 70 degrees, uh, even higher. Uh, the meteoric water values would be uh, appropriate for the modern world. Uh, uh, meteoric water would be between minus 20 and uh, minus, uh, and maybe plus one per mil. Uh, there is a depletion here uh, at about 2.4 billion years because we have an overabundance of singlacially deposited uh, shales and tillites. Uh, what if we change the meteoric water value uh, 
to uh, seawater value to minus five per mil and use this uh, meteoric waterline equation with excess of 17 or by keeping this parameter the same. So we are able to obtain temperature which are below 50 degrees Celsius, which is uh, very comforting. Again, the singulation in placed shales would give you a uh, low temperature and also low delta T no value. Uh, so this solution is also permissible. So what if we use meteoric water value of minus 10 and 15, then we'll find no data points which are able to resolve. So they, they become irrational. And uh, you can see that it's already moving from this uh, world to this world and the scale here is different. This is from two to four and this is from one to four. Uh, we lost some data points because we're not able to solve them. So the solution for Archean um, uh, seawater is likely to be between zero per mil and minus five per mil. We have two minutes. Yes, this is what I'm, um, I'm saying here. Last two slides. Uh, last uh, um, effort in the paper in the chapter was an um, investigation of uh, grains through time. Um, so on this diagram, I, I, I plotted analysis of quartz, uh, which were performed in the lab, blue uh, symbols, and then uh, also compiled data from literature uh, targeting orogenic grains, the ones which formed in subduction zones and uh, mountain building during mountain building episodes. Um, and then 17 no parameter for the same uh, granites, uh, analyzing uh, zircon and uh, uh, mostly quartz from these granites. Uh, to our surprise, we observed a similar step, stepwise function in granites through time. And uh, shales are shown in the background. Uh, maybe this is no surprise because the granites, orogenic granites, especially they form as a result of remelting of um, sedimentary rocks you know, during the rock cycle. When we plot everything which we analyzed um, on this diagram um, versus now versus 0.5 to 8, as recommended by Andreas very heavily, uh, and then uh, we fit the lines from the mantle <clears throat> to, uh, through the various data sets, we observe the slopes of approximately 0.5 uh, to 3. And I call this uh, line as a crustal array, as a conventional uh, isotope J chemistry. So this slope is different than the high temperature slopes of 0.5 to 8, etc. So maybe uh, when we consider uh, river sediments, shales, and even granites, they all represent the uh, low temperature theta of 0.5, uh, uh, should be the other way around. I mean, our number is incorrect. Um, 0.5 to 3. Um, so this is the... Uh, value which is typical at low temperature environments. So this is the crustal array reflects the fact that continental crust went through weathering. And this is a weathering signature uh, of um, the upper continental crust. That brings me to my conclusions, uh, which uh, I will just leave with you. You can just read them on, this, uh, uh, on the screen. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Ilya, for your uh, nice presentation. And uh, I think it's it's exciting, well, exciting insights from rocks that um, I usually prevented. I mean, all this hydrous stuff in the uh, you know in the fluorination line. Um, are there any questions, Anne, in the yeah, chat? There is one. It is what is the effect of enhanced weathering due to an emergence of plants? on the triple oxygen isotope of shale. Does organic weathering have any effect? Uh, well, we don't know yet. So that's the um, an attempt, uh, something which we are trying to do uh, right now. So you can, I can see the picture of the Gondwana uh, in a, a different configuration of tectonic plates. You would observe climates which are different in different parts of the world. Uh, in advent of plants and enhanced weathering uh, is of course something to consider. So uh, we are currently analyzing uh, shales uh, in the Phanerozoic, uh, trying to answer this question. So the brief answer is the supercontinent cycle uh, plays an important role in the global climate, such as um, snowball earth events, uh, et cetera, play uh, also an important role. So the advent of plants will likely be uh, the same magnitude as um, maybe a global glaciation, uh, but a little bit less than supercontinent cycle. Um, given like the, my um, 
parsimonious view on the data set which we have so far.